Welcome to another edition of Amplify Your Business. Today, we're going to be talking to Ashley Jansen, who is the co-founder of Code and Effect, and she is also the founder of Ashley Jansen Consulting. And so Ashley is going to share with us some uh, crises that occurred in their business, as well as in her personal life with her husband and an illness uh, that really um, impacted their business. She's going to share some stories about how they managed through that, and then also give us some tips on how to basically manage chaos within our business. So how do we manage chaos as entrepreneurs? And so welcome to the show, Ashley. I'm really looking forward to this. Thanks for having me. So Ashley, tell me a little bit about your journey to now. So how did you get into becoming an entrepreneur and a little bit of a backstory about your first business, which was Code and Effect? So I actually went to the University of Alberta and I got a Bachelor of Arts in Psychology and my original path was I wanted to be a counselor. I applied to the U of A uh, to get my master's, but I didn't get in. And it is a very competitive program um, and I'd only applied there, but I I didn't get in. So I ended up, when I finished university, I ended up working for the government of Alberta. In the meantime, um, my then boyfriend, now husband, had started freelancing uh, in his last year of university as a web developer and was sort of building, building that business. And we got married in 2009. And honestly, on our honeymoon, we were in Mazatlan. I happened to be perusing the CPC website and saw a headline that said, Alberta government imposes hiring freeze. And suddenly uh, I found out that my contract position with the government, which originally was supposed to roll into a full-time position, was going to be over. Uh, So I was going to lose my job. Dana, my husband, and I uh, had discussed working together before, but had never pulled the trigger. And like I said, it wasn't really something I thought was was really a path for me, Um, whereas he comes from a very entrepreneurial family. But, you know, the more we talked about it, we decided, you know what, this is this is a chance we, we, you know, we're in a position to do this. So we pulled the trigger and then we got home. I actually quit uh, the government two months early uh, because we were ready to go. And yeah, I took over all the business uh, um, and client management and he focused on delivery. So uh, fast forward a few years and we were building. um, It was 2012 and. Uh, there were six of us working out of my townhouse, including us and two cats. Uh, that at, sounds two very much. Yeah, that sounds very <laughs> much like an entrepreneurial story, right? Everybody yeah. jammed in. <laughs> jammed in, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we had uh, two standing desks in our kitchen. <laughs> um, <laughs> yeah, it was a little, little crowded, but we were we were making it work. Um, but we actually had a very uh, stark turn of events where. Uh, Dana was diagnosed with cancer. You know, we got this diagnosis and suddenly it was this, we got to figure this out. And, and, you know, as partners, um, not only in as, as, as life partners, but as business partners, obviously it was pretty serious in terms of how we needed to adjust the business. Um, so, you know, I took over everything I could from Dana, figured out, you know, who needed to know what was the communication plan to our clients, um, found, negotiated, and decorated, uh, and then moved into office space uh, with, with our team. So they weren't in our townhouse anymore, Yeah, you know, and also, you know, our team was obviously pretty freaked out, both in terms of being worried about Dana, as well as for their, their jobs, of course. Yeah. Because so, Dana is, is the, uh, you know, a core, a huge part of the business yeah, uh, delivery yeah. side of things, right? Because you were handling yeah. more of the business op side and he was handling the delivery side. Eh? That's right. Yeah. That's right. You know, I would say that I'd, I'd kind of settled into parts of entrepreneurship, but that it was still, I don't know that I totally internalized that I was in fact an entrepreneur and that, that uh, this, is, this was also my business. It was something I was still kind of working through, but suddenly, yep. you know, I had to take over a lot. For, I, I tried to take over everything possible I could from Dana um, and, you know, kind of support our team, do everything possible to make it, you know, let him focus on, on, being as well as he can through his treatment and manage sort of that. Yeah. You know, we so, did, we, so this is the ahead. point in which most people are going to just be, you know, completely overwhelmed and uh, feeling like you, you got to step back out of this, the chaos that is normally is around uh, entrepreneurship and, and startup and growth and everything else to just really, uh, try to find something that is a little bit more stable, I suppose you could say. Um, but, in the midst of this, you then find a, a, an actual location for the business. You move the business out of the townhouse. You have your team now located there. You're taking on double what you had on your plate before. Yeah. Plus on top of that, 
you have obviously all of your the emotions and the concerns and everything else that's going along with your husband's um, medical situation and having to deal with that as well. And obviously we spent a lot of time at the hospital and so on. So that, that I just find that absolutely fascinating that this person who is a self-proclaimed non-entrepreneur at the start of all this was able to manage through that. So can you, can you speak to that a little bit? Like how did you step into it even deeper and take on all of that when that's would have broke most people, uh, just one of those things happening, essentially. Honestly, it didn't really feel like there was a choice because like, you know, it was, it was kind of a sink or swim situation where we, you know, we've been building this business together and you know, I knew how important it was to Dana. It was important to me. And, and in, in a lot of ways, it was, it was the only thing I could do. Um, I think, you know, I loved him and love him so much. And I just couldn't, I couldn't let him down. I couldn't let our team down. And, you know, I am, I am pretty good in a crisis. So it was kind of this, this like, like, like do or die, you figure it out, you, you do the next best thing. So, you know, we honestly, I never thought of quitting. I never thought about not going ahead. I never thought of, of any other option of, I'm just going to do this and figure it out and hope for the best. And, yeah. and, you know, we were also really fortunate. We did of course have, a, you know, a lot of family support and a lot of friend support, but there was, in, in a lot of ways, it was, our life became very small and, and it was, uh, his chemo cycles were three weeks. So we kind of had these three week cycles of, that was sort of the time frame that we could, you know, work within. And as someone who's very future oriented, I shifted into being, kind of having to be very present oriented. So, you know, we did things like, we called them uh, management meetings where he, you know, for one of his treatments, he was admitted at the cross for six days at a time. So we would really walk around with his IV pool doing like laps around uh, the third floor because he needed to get fluid moving in his body. And we'd, you know, we'd talk about projects and try and figure things out. Or, mm. you know, I did a prototype review in the family waiting room or, he, I remember one time he was, he was literally in emergency, uh, waiting to be admitted. And I had to take a phone call in like a hospital stairway <laughs> and go turn my phone on mute every time the intercom went off for, for the hospital announcements, you know, or writing website content outside. It was all just sort of like, what is the next best thing I have to do today to get through to tomorrow? And, and that was it. And, you know, fortunately, again, we had a lot of support, but it was, it was just sink or swim. And, and I chose to swim. To be honest, Dana still worked that whole time. Like he had a little laptop that he'd be in chemo. He'd be talking to our team. He would be working on things. Like he was incredible. He was he was a superstar the whole time. Um, mm. So I can't diminish that either because he yeah. was he was pretty incredible. Okay, so you've moved out of the house. You have your team now located in a in an office space. Your husband's doing chemo. You're supporting him on that. And how's the business going then at that point? Somehow we actually grew it. Uh, so we, you know, we, we managed to, like I said, once we settled in at the office and I think it was part of it, we got into, into kind of a rhythm. And once we had sort of general expectations for, for what, what was happening and um, again, just like move forward. Our team was awesome. We just, we just kept going and we somehow managed to grow our revenue that year. We added a team member, we, we, we grew. And as, as Dana transitioned uh, and he finished chemo and was in kind of recovery and was able to come back uh, to the office more full time, we just kept going, we just kept building from there. And, um, you know, it was, yeah, I, I honestly, I don't even know. It was just a lot of just like, again, figuring it out as we went and, and having really wonderful people around us. Yeah. And so you, uh, you know, took on all these, these, I, th I think in a previous conversation, you called it as stretch roles. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, which I, I love that term because it definitely did stretch you outside of your comfort zone, I would imagine. And very far. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And so, one thing that I would love to uh, hear as well is, is, I mean, you became probably the, the face of the company then at yes. that point, especially with your team and, and the growing team. So, how did you? Um, I guess, motivate that team? How did you, um, you know, ensure that they felt secure uh, that this, this was, uh, everything was going to be okay in those early days of it? And obviously, as you guys were continuing to grow, they, they would have saw that and, and felt really good about things at that point. But in those early days, how did you manage that HR aspect of it, essentially, to, to keep the team together and all 
all, you know, rowing in the same direction, so to speak. I think it was just a lot of um, open communication. So it was, it was like, we never hid anything from them. We were open about what was happening and where we were at. And, um, you know, essentially also open about how projects were going, how the business was doing. So they had a very clear understanding of where things were at and their part in it. So, you know, as a team, we knew in a lot of, you know, we had the projects that we were already working on and, you know, the, you know, as a software consulting company, we were kind of doing the, the, the constant chase of looking for, for new projects uh, and growth, but everyone was clear in their roles. And, and yeah, I think it was just a lot of really consistent ongoing communication about where we were at. Now, were you able to distribute some of your tasks into the team as it was growing or was the growth just mostly, you know, on execution of these, uh, of, of the, um, the design and everything else that you guys were doing in the web development? Was it more on that side? And so you didn't have that luxury of being able to build in supports for yourself or, um, you know, walk me through a little bit of how that sure. all worked I would say it was more on the execution side and, and the actual development uh, and, and uh, cause we're, we're mostly focused on uh, backend development. So it was, it was, it was developers and coders. Um, yeah. So a lot of that, um, was sort of where the capacity got built. So I would say a lot of my role ended up having to be me. Um, but that, you know, I would say that our team definitely did pick up slack where they, where they could and where there was opportunities to. And at the end of the day, there was sort of things that just I, I couldn't do or just didn't get done. So, you know, you had to, I had to also be conscious of letting go. Some of the, my perfectionist tendencies had to be calmed quite a bit of just like, there's no space in in me for this there's no space you know i don't have anyone i can delegate this to and maybe it just isn't important enough to to get done and some of those decisions also had to happen we also honestly our clients were really great you know we were we were really scared that um our clients would also be scared enough to leave where you know they weren't wouldn't be confident that we could actually deliver on what we'd what we'd agreed to which is fair you know it's, it's not personal it's, it's a business uh, situation but we didn't have anything like that happen we were very open also with them and on the few occasions where we requested some kind of extension or or needed a little bit more time on something they were really wonderful you know we were in the fortunate position that a lot of our projects weren't um, super, super time sensitive. So asking for a little bit more space was not, it was not a problem and our, and our customers were awesome. I'm also curious about any other lessons that, uh, maybe you might've learned as you were going through, you know, this crisis, uh, but then also at the same time, the growth of the business, is there, is there anything that uh, you can point to of, of really uh, key learnings that you had along the way on that journey yourself? And then also potentially, was there anything now, you know, with that all in the rearview mirror that you would have done differently, um, that you would have structured things differently or brought on different people or, or whatever the case might be? Anything you can share there? Sure. So I think, I mean, we had a lot happen after that as well, and it all kind of led to the, the one of the biggest lessons is, is, is actually more of a, a life lesson that is, is you only get one life and it's really easy to waste time. And mm. so, you know, it, it ended up coming down to don't defer things that are important to you until some unknown later time, which because I think in the entrepreneurial narrative is, is it's, it's often like work really, really hard now so that at some future time you will get to reap the benefits of all the hard work you've put in. Yeah. And it's that, that go, 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 go. And I think that, you know, as we went through that experience and, and some of the, the experiences that followed, we got really, really clear on our values and, and um, the type of business we wanted to build that I think, you know, not everyone, there's a lot of sort of framing that there's only one way to build a business. And, and I think that's, that's um, learning that there's many different ways to build a business and many different ways that that can look and that you don't have to do it the way everybody else is doing it was, it was a big one. And, you know, we were so young when, when we started and kind of muddled through that. I think that was, that was one of the really, really big ones and kind of connected to that was being really intentional about, you know, I think we have so much more power over our experiences and the decisions we make uh, and, and how, you know, our time ends up, you know, looking and, you know, how precious that time is. And again, it sounds kind of trite, but it, it's, it's very much being conscious of those things because things can change very quickly as we were growing sort of that, 
these kind of are, are three uh, quotes that are, are really, these are ones that have been like kind of rolling around in my head for many years. And then I think came from, from these experiences was first ones uh, don't compare your insides to someone else's outsides. Mm. Uh, and then don't compare your beginning to someone else's middle, which are, are very similar. And I think it's that, that sort of, a, again, as we, as we were growing and figuring things out. And again, I, f- I often felt like just flying by the seat of our pants uh, and just like, again, always just doing what, you know, the next best thing there was, I know for me in particular, there was just all this like fear and feeling of like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm not good enough for this. I don't know what, like, I don't know this um, where, you know, you look out and you think everybody else has their, has their stuff together. They know what they're doing when, you know, there's, there's, I think a lot of opportunity to, first of all, know that people only share parts of themselves. Um, and, and also that there's so much opportunity to learn from others and, and not versus compare. Um, and then kind of connected to that um, is uh, a quote from Trevor Noah, who he said, we spend so much time being afraid of failure, afraid of rejection, but regret is the thing we should fear most. Mm. And I think that, you know, fear of failure is so common for entrepreneurs and, um, I know that it's, it was something that, you know, hung over me a lot was I was so, so afraid of, of, of making a mess, failing, not being good enough. And instead, I think it's much, it's much better to fail because at least you tried. Uh, and, and those are kind of like, the, I would say the big lessons of as, as we, as we muddled through and tried things and, you know, as, as every entrepreneur has gone through, you know, we went through, you know, what, after Dana finished chemo things, we kind of, you know, continued to build the business. And then we, in t- uh, 2016, we had to do layoffs uh, when the, when the economy tanked, um, we kind of had the trickle down when the economy uh, was, was, was not doing well. And again, there's, there's always lessons to learn things to figure out. Um, but that doesn't mean that we were like terrible business owners and shouldn't be running a business. You know, it's really thinking about those things. Yeah. Yeah. It's really easy to, to, uh, start to really doubt your own abilities and are you doing the right things and so yeah. on. You have a, a, an overall economic downturn that's actually pushing or suppressing the growth of the company. Yeah. Yeah. So, so talk me, uh, or tell me a little bit about, uh, then the transition that you made into creating then your consultancy. So Ashley Jansen consulting and what you do there as well. And, and why basically you decided that that was a direction that you wanted to go in addition to still being the co-founder and involved in code and effect. Yeah. So, uh, so Dana went through five years of scans post chemo uh, to uh, every three to six months to, to essentially see if it had come back. And then at the end of those scans, essentially it was, he would be declared cured and he was so awesome. It was, it was, um, you know, it was it definitely hung over us for a long time. And uh, unfortunately though, kind of, I guess it was about three weeks before he got the all clear, uh, I was diagnosed with multiple sclerosis. So we kind of got another uh, big, big kick to the teeth uh, and, 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 and an unnecessary reminder of, you know, how quickly life can change and that, you know, the, the futures that we imagine are, are definitely not guaranteed. And the reason that that's relevant was that it sort of became a, a driver for um, I, I recently started blogging because I, I, I liked writing. I've always liked writing um, and had kind of, I have a, a special skill of, of being very, very structured and very process oriented and very organized that I had come to realize was not, uh, not natural to most others I came across. And uh, as I blogged about it, you know, I started to um, get asked to do speaking opportunities and some of them were, were code and effect related where it was, uh, you know, being tech related and some of it then ended up being like doing workshops, teaching some of these productivity tactics and, and learnings and organizational uh, tactics. And, and then from there, I started getting asked to do um, one-on-one consulting and it was very random. It was sort of this, uh, you know, not cultivated, not planned um, but what happened was sort of over, over the year, over a few years, I realized that, you know, it was something I loved. It was, it was, it was the, one of the things I looked forward to most was doing those one-on-one sessions and, and writing. And, you know, it kind of over, over those years, uh, as you know, over about the next five years, um, I guess four years from, from my, from my diagnosis, um, it kind of pushed me down the road of clarity about my own, the own work that I really loved and my own talents. And, um, 
I'm, I'm happy to say from a, from a health perspective that I've been in remission for, for most of the time that, uh, since I was diagnosed, I'm on medication. I've been, um, highly motivated to take really good care of myself. I actually had 1500 days in a row of my fitness streak yesterday. Awesome. Um, but all of this kind of combined into getting a lot of clarity on, you know, what did I want out of my life and what was I really passionate about? And, you know, what did I know I was really good at it? So, you know, what was my hedgehog? If you want your, your John, uh, Jim Collins uh, term. And, you know, I, I love to write and I love working with people and I love helping people. And it ended up being kind of this full circle to that uh, dream of, of being a counselor when I was back in university. So about seven months ago, I uh, decided to uh, shift over to like 80, 20, uh, focusing on the, on the coaching and consulting side of things. Uh, because Code and Effect was in a really awesome position and my partners were super supportive and I was able to do it. That's, that's really exciting. And so what are you doing then uh, in terms of the, the core part of your consulting and coaching? Yeah, so my, I call myself a productivity consultant and it comes from the core of you know, the learnings between Dana's, uh, or my experience supporting Dana through his cancer treatment as well as my own, my own MS diagnosis and my health about you know productivity is, is really about being intentional about how you spend your time, your energy and attention in all parts of your life. So I honestly, I work with entrepreneurs and business leaders to calm their chaos. I like to say that's my superpower uh, and, and reduce burnout through intentional time management. So it's really, um, I work with mostly people who are either close, close to burnout or who are already there and, and bring them back down to more healthy levels so that they can get back to actually working on their goals. Yeah, and I can't, imagine another person that is more, I, I guess, uh, experienced or has the expertise that you, that you would have going through what you went through, uh, both through Dana's experience there with cancer, and then also your MS uh, diagnosis as well, and still growing this incredible business. And so, yeah, but that's, that's coming from somebody who is in the trenches, who's actually done all these things that you're coaching people on. And so I, I can see that being just a, a tremendous, uh, opportunity for you to, to help others with similar crises or chaos in their life, or not even similar, but just generally chaos in their lives. Eh? Yeah. Yeah. It's been a really neat journey. And I think, you know, I, you know, I'm coming up on, I guess, almost 14 years of, of, of business uh, through, you know, being supporting Dana as he started uh, his freelancing all the way through to, to now. And, you know, so I've got, you know, I know what it's like to, to grow a team. I know what it's like to be through all these things. And yep. I, I like, it's been interesting to be able to combine my, my incredible structured personality to, to also, you know, helping others try and, and, and come down from that. Okay, so you mentioned that you consult on and coach people on uh, the common, you know, uh, or how to overcome burnout and, and uh, in, in particular entrepreneurs. And so what are some of the common characteristics or behaviors you see amongst those people who you engage, those entrepreneurs that you engage in this aspect of your coaching? Yeah, so the first one is that they tend to be very reactive and passive about how they spend their time. So they tend to let others, people dictate their schedules um, mm -hmm. and they don't necessarily have a good clarity on their energy needs. So, you know, thinking about, you know, I talk about I'm, I'm very introverted and like introverts, extroverts, whatever, you know, you, wherever you identify that being really sort of clear on, on where you're putting your time and energy. They tend to be, like I said, they don't think enough about um, how they're planning their schedules, the types of things they commit to. And I would say connected to that is that they tend to put themselves last uh, and, and don't know how to set boundaries. So even around things like things like email meetings and, and even just their availability to their families, their teams, there's sort of this assumption that they need to be available at all times. So it's often working through um, setting, learning how to set those boundaries, calm their schedules. And, and, and finally, um, they tend to be very like fear motivated in the decisions they make. So yes. things like fear of missing out on money, fear of missing out on connection, uh, people pleasing is a big one. Um, fear of conflict and then, and then, and judgment is the other one uh, being really, um, constantly worried about what other people think and, and it, which, you know, connects back to my experience of, 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 of that and, and worrying 
about not doing it, you know, not doing it right and, and not building the business the way it should be versus being more reflective about what do you want out of your business and what do you want out of your life uh, going forward? So I'd say those are, those are kind of the big ones. I think this is the reality for so many entrepreneurs out there is that we are trying to do so many things. We're trying to please so many people. Mm -hmm. We're trying to please the, the, the client base, but then also our team who are, we need to execute on those elements. Right. And, yeah. and, um, and that's where that we get into the trap of wearing so many hats and being pulled in so many different directions. And then I think we also get into this trap of that's how we find or feel important or our importance is yeah, yeah. the more people are wanting of us and needing us, the, the more it's like, yeah, okay. Yeah. I'm, I'm valued or something along that line. And, and that's uh, so devastating from a business perspective because yeah. you just puts you as the, as, as really the pinch point within your business and, and it's your capacity then that dictates the success or, or lack of success of your business and then you're in a situation of uh, just spending, making that that time trade off, right? Where you just are spending so many hours in the business. Yeah, and it ends up being that you know, like you said, you, you essentially tied your identity to your business, and mm -hmm. so yeah. it ends up being that that you know, you think the more you put in, the more you'll get out, but it ends up being it just diminishes you so much. Versus, you know, being able to set those clear boundaries and get a lot of clarity on 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 what you actually want and what you're what you're willing to give. Because I think that's part of it too. Is is I think, you know, you do have to make sacrifices as an entrepreneur. But I don't think people necessarily, especially new entrepreneurs, take the time to think about what sacrifices they're willing to make. Yeah. Again, they're very they're very passive about it, and suddenly they're underwater and they don't know how they got there. Yeah, 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 completely. And so I think I I. I have a sense as to what you would consider to be, you know, kind of the top three things that people need to focus on because you've kind of alluded to some of it already, yeah. but if you want to just summarize that uh, for our audience and give them a little bit of uh, free advice here, that would be fantastic. So if you had to nail down like three things that every entrepreneur needs to do in order to calm the chaos in their lives and in their business, what would be those top three Sure. So the first one I would say is you have to get your schedule under control. That's the very first thing. Yeah. And you do that through obligation elimination and saying no. So first of all, when you're, when you're trying to do that, you need to evaluate your existing com commitments against your values first. So, you know, where does this fit in with our, my value set and the things I want to be working on and I want to be doing, and then do the same thing, evaluate your commitments against your goals. So when you think about what are you, you know, where are you putting your time and energy? Are they in alignment with what you're trying to achieve as a team, as an organization? Because if they aren't, for example, if it's, you know, are you, are you focusing on someone else's fire, um, which is really common, then you're obviously, that's, that's one of the ways that you get that people pleasing, you're not saying no to things. So, you know, when you look at your existing commitments, either it's really, it's the four Ds, it's what can be declined, what can be delegated, what can be deferred, and then finally, what has to be done. Hmm. And, and from there, you can kind of map out, I call it the ideal week. So it's really figuring out um, if I were to plan, given what I know about my life commitments, as well as my business commitments, what would my ideal week look like? And this includes things like your commute, eating breakfast, eating lunch, when do you go home for dinner, like things that like, we, we always, and I see this over and over again with my clients, is they underestimate how much time is actually available in a day, given all of the other things that are just like normal life things, like you have to eat. Um, and then suddenly they're all disappointed with how much work got done because they're like, well, why didn't I get all these things done when, when they completely did not look at, at what was actually available to them? Um, and, and part of that is also, you know, the saying no part is, establishing protected time and days. So thinking about, you know, don't have 15 meetings uh, planned over the course of an entire week. Um, you know, for, for example, I uh, almost exclusively don't take meetings on Fridays. Um, I try not to take meetings on Mondays. And most of my uh, consulting sessions are uh, because I prefer afternoon meetings are Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. That's, those are my meeting slots. And that's, I, I book them together and I'm very intentional about that. So, so like I said, first thing, get your, get your calendar under control so that you're not essentially jumping from meeting to meeting to meeting, fire to fire to fire. Makes sense. And, okay. Yeah. Number two. Number two. This one is, is a big one and it's literally reframing self-care 
uh, from being something you know, selfish or indulgent or something you do once a year when you take your annual vacation as, as actually, an, it's a competitive advantage. Uh, and if you think of it as that, it, you know, and, and you're able to articulate what self-care means to you. And I, you know, I kind of think self-care gets a bad rep because it's like, is it a, you know, I'm not going for a massage or a bubble bath, but it's really thinking about what are, you know, what are the things that you do that recharge you is, is really what self-care is. And then you have to practice it every single day. It's not something you do on occasion. It's not something that, that is, 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 you know, maybe on the weekend you'll get a good sleep. You have to have it part of every single day. Because at the end of the day, when you think from a competitive advantage perspective, no one does good work or is productive or creative or inspired when they're exhausted. You don't make good decisions. So every time you overwork yourself, you're putting yourself and your business at a disadvantage. So, you know, if you're already doing, if you're already burnt out, you're not even doing self-care, you're doing aftercare because you're already in that diminished state. So really it's about reshaping self-care and figuring out what it means to you and how you can fit it into every day and literally book it. If you have to put it in your calendar, like book it in there and protect that time. I, I love what you said there just around the shifting of the way that you frame it. Um, you know, mentally yourself, because I think that is a huge issue for a lot of business owners is that there's a guilt. I know that I feel when I'm choosing self-care over, you know, there's always this massive list of to-dos, you know, within the business that you just never seem to get, get done that list. And so it always is guilt. Like I have this internal guilt when I step away from that list. Uh, for the self-care, but you're bang on. Like if you can mentally switch that to, this is a competitive advantage. This is what's going to actually allow me to outcompete my competition or to achieve that goal, whatever that goal is going to be that you have within the company. Uh, if you can frame it that way, who the hell wouldn't then take that? Exactly. Time, right? Exactly. Yeah. And it's, yeah, yeah. And, and, and again, making sure that, and, and, and honestly, also sharing that same framework with your team. Uh, would be yeah. would be kind of the part of that is that like you don't want employees that are overworked and working crazy hours because like tired people don't do good work. Yeah, yeah, you know, and it's it's bad for everybody. Yeah, completely. Okay, number three. Number three. So this one you might not have thought of uh, is is a daily reflection. So I am all about daily reflection because it cultivates self-awareness and it gives you sort of the data that you and information that you would need to like notice, uh, you know, behaviors, habits, um, how you're feeling and what you're spending your time on. Because I think one of the problems, again, I talk about people being very passive and reactive uh, about their time is that they don't take the time to actually think back on what are they doing? What are they giving their time to? And you know, are you actually spending the time on the priorities that you've identified? Um, so if you're doing a daily reflection, so for example, the one, the one I, I always recommend uh, is literally once a day, look back and say, what went well today? What was tricky? And what would I have done differently? Hmm. And um, I also like to add in uh, what am I grateful for? Because there's always a little bit of room for gratitude. Yeah. But really, it's, it's thinking back and saying, you know, you, you, you can't, change or improve something if you don't know what's happening. So really it's, it's this, this, the reflection becomes a data collection on what am I doing? How do I feel? And how can I regularly improve? And, and so is this something you're doing, uh, you'd recommend doing at the end of the business days so of carving out a half an hour uh, before you, you turn out for the day um, to do that? Or is this something in the evening before you, you go to bed and you're unwinding and thinking yeah. about the, the day? What, what's your recommendation there? I think it's uh, kind of a to each their own. Personally, I do mine at the end of the day. Uh, so about like eight o'clock is usually when I'm, I'm settling in to, to hang out in bed and read my book and hang, you know, uh, settle down. And it's kind of, again, and doesn't even need to be a long thing. I have, a, I, I use a spreadsheet, but you can use a notebook. It's literally just this take, take 15 minutes and think like, you know, like, what did I even do today? How was it? How do I feel about it? How am I feeling? You know, really thinking about, you know, what are my patterns? And, and even taking a little bit of time to look back at even the last few days, if, if, you know, you're feeling particularly off, what's going on. And then you can say, you know what, maybe I need to add a little bit more self-care or maybe I need to shift this or, 
even you know if you're having trouble with a, a team member you start to notice patterns over time because you noted them what's the language you're using there's all kinds of pieces that you you know if you can take that time and and i say it daily because i don't know about you but i don't remember uh if, if i do it you know like three days later you're like what did i do so yeah. you know actually taking getting and getting some of the nuance of, of the days and then and then kind of taking the patterns from there yeah, and I, I personally like doing reflection um, in the evening before I kind of turn out the light. Um, so I even do it a little bit later than what you do. And the reason why I do that is sometimes um, it also, like I also look at what my schedule is for the next morning. Sure. And I don't know if that's like, like I can see that being negative for some people where they then are playing things around in their mind too much or they get concerned about what's coming up on the calendar. But I really like to do that in uh, at the same time so that, um, my unconscious mind can kind of play around with some of that. Sure. Um, and I can, uh, wake up feeling actually quite prepared for the, the next day too. So I reflect, and then I also take a look at what's, what's, uh, coming at what's me coming. in terms of problems or challenges or, or the, the agenda. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Interesting. Okay. Well, that's three amazing tips. And I think our audience is going to be able to really benefit from those. And I know you have a ton of others. And so obviously there's going to be people who are going to want to connect with you. And if they did want to, how is the best way to connect with you to discuss what you can do to help coach them and support them through their entrepreneurial journeys? Yeah. So they can uh, check out my website at ashleyjohnson.com. Uh, and I've got a free consultation uh, link there if people want to have a chat. Uh, otherwise, they can email me. It's just ashley at ashleyjansen.com. And I'd be happy to discuss. And I also have a, a, a weekly newsletter that I publish with all kinds of uh, uh, tips and tactics and reflections and sort of different ways of thinking and living with intention uh, that which you can subs uh, subscribe to on my website and read, read my back catalog of, of other posts as well. Excellent. I didn't know about the uh, newsletter. So that's what I'm doing right after this so that I can start having some of those delivered to my inbox as well. So thank you, Ashley. I really appreciate you uh, sharing your journey, the challenges that you guys have uh, experienced through it, and then obviously how you came through that. It's just incredibly inspiring. Um, it just, you know, I, I often talk to my son about this in terms of, you know, like when he gets down on himself and he feels like he can't accomplish something or that it's like, oh, it's, it's just too insurmountable of a task or challenge that's in front of him. And it's like, you know, there's so many people who have had so many more challenges in life than what you're experiencing right now. Uh, and they've managed to make through, th get through it all and actually come out really super successful. And uh, you are living proof of that, what you and Dana were able to, to do through the illnesses. And, and uh, it's just fantastic now to see that you're circling back to that dream of, of uh, really counseling people and helping people. And you've just taken that body of knowledge that you've accumulated as an entrepreneur in chaos to help other entrepreneurs. And so thank you very much for that. That's a really inspiring and really cool story. Thank you. Thanks for letting me share it. And I appreciate the opportunity, Liz. Okay, so what a great episode. Thank you so much, Ashley. And for those of you who enjoyed this episode, we have many more over in our archives at amplifyyourbusiness.ca. And there's actually a form on there if you happen to be an entrepreneur or a small business owner who has a great story to share, fill out the application and you could be on a future episode. So thanks again, Ashley. I really appreciate your time and stay safe, everybody. And I'll see you in the next episode.